This message today is not the easiest message for me to preach or for any preacher to preach as far as that goes. We continue on in the journeys of Joshua and the Israelites. We were in that uh, series of messages before Easter and uh, they had just taken Jericho and defeated there and and of course Rahab and her family were saved. Before I get started in the message, I want to tell you that uh, and say to this to any of you and to the listening audience as well, if I've done anything or said anything wrong to anybody um, that offended you and has offended anyone, uh, I want to tell you I apologize. I'm so sorry. Uh, I'm not the perfect guy in the world. I make mistakes. I say things sometimes that uh, maybe comes off wrong. I do things that's not pleasing to God. i be honest with you as honest as I can. And, uh, but I'm glad that I have a God who is forgiving and loving and is full of mercy and grace. And he forgives us all for our shortcomings. So I wanted to start that off. And if I don't get any further in my ministry, I won't clear the record with you who are here, all of you who are listening, that uh, if you're offended in any way, what shape, form, or fashion with me in the past, please forgive me. I'm reminded how it is easy to cover sin. Uh, in fact, even in the Garden of Eden it began. Uh, Adam blamed Eve. She made me do it. The woman you gave me, he told God. You gave me God. And he actually blamed Eve and God, didn't he? And then Eve said, the serpent made me do it. Well, you know, that's a cop-out with many of us today. We use that expression, the devil made me do it. And uh, that's an easy expression uh, when we uh, violate God's commands and rules and regulations. Stories told of a man who felt sure his wife was cheating on him. And uh, set in the scene, they lived in an upstairs apartment about four stories high, and the window to their kitchen uh, faced the street down below. So one day, the husband got to think he was so sure that the man that she was running around with was in the apartment, and he went to the apartment, knocked the door down, searched for the man under the beds, in the closets. Couldn't find the man anywhere and he got so upset that he picked up the refrigerator and threw it out the window. Uh, and of course it went sailing through the air uh, down to the cement and the walkway. The scene changes. Two men wound up in heaven, pearly gates, St. Peter asked the first man, he says, you know, he said, you're ahead of your time. What happened? He said, well, Peter, I was walking down the street minding my own business. All of a sudden, this refrigerator came flying out of the sky and hit me. And Peter said, well, accidents do happen. So, welcome to heaven. So he went to the next guy and he said, now, what about you? I don't have a record of you coming here for a long time. He said, well, Peter, I was sitting in this refrigerator, minding my own business, and all of a sudden, I hit the ground. You know, the church is a wonderful place that God has instituted. One of the greatest organizations on the face of God's given earth. And it's God's instrument, the only instrument, 
for transformating the church, the body, or the world. In other words, he uses the body of Christ, you and I who have been saved, to reach those people who need to be reached and who are lost. But at its best, it is the greatest thing in the world. But I look around and I want to tell you, it, it disturbs me and it breaks my heart because I see so many churches in decline. I read about pastors who've been in the ministry for years who've become discouraged and despondent and ready to throw up their hands and just get out of the ministry whatsoever. I talked to one fellow minister not long ago and said, Wayne, he said, he said, I did not realize being a pastor would put so much pressure on my life. He said, I've tried to do everything I could as a good pastor, but it seems like the more I do, the more good I do, the worse things get. And he said, I'm just to a point that I'm tired. But I see men and women called by God also to serve in the ministries, and I see them struggling. I see churches filled with conflict. And it don't take a rocket science to see churches and pastors who stand in the pulpits who preach anything but the truth. And I wonder why. Why can't the church be what God called us to be? When I remember what Peter said, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I wonder what's wrong with Christendom today. Supposedly Christendom. What's wrong with God's people? Well, I want to go back in history a little bit. God's people crossed over the Jordan River and, and camped at Gilgal. And Joshua had sent two spies out to Jericho, as we preached a few weeks ago. The city walls were so thick, the chariots could ride on top, and God told Joshua to rise and go around the city once a day for six days, and on the seventh day, go around it seven times. And he said, when I given Jericho to you, when I tell you to tell your people to shout and blow the trumpets, and Israel did as God commanded, and for six days they marched, and for the seventh day they marched seven times, and they blew the horns and shouted, and the walls came falling down. But a few days later, Joshua sent spies to look out the city of Ahi. Now Ahi was just a little hole in the wall compared to Jericho, and the spies came back and said, you know, Joshua, we don't need to send too many men over there because... You know, they're not a big city. We could take a couple of thousand or three thousand of our men, go over there and wipe them out and be done with it. And Joshua sent 3,000 men or so, and they were defeated. 36 of the men was killed. It brought fear in the hearts of the Israelites, and they ran from that little city of Ahi. Joshua fell on his face. Why, God? You have helped us cross the Jordan River. You've helped us conquer Jericho, one of the greatest strongholds we had facing us in the Promised Land. But here, this little city that we could have wiped out in minutes, why did you allow us to fail? Why did we fail? And Joshua was defeated and struggling. And then God said to Joshua, I like this, Joshua, stand up. Why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. Israel is unable to stand before the enemies because someone has stolen a devoted thing and hid them among his own possessions. In other words, they were given the command when they went to Jericho not to take one single thing from that city. And old Achan had an aching heart. He decided that he would take some of the things 
the possessions of Jericho secretly and take them back to the camp and hide them. And of course, the Bible tells us that God's anger turned away from the people of Israel. Now, that isn't such a great story, is it? I mean, you probably didn't wake up this morning coming, coming to church and saying, well, I, I wasn't expecting to hear a message on sin and <clears throat> how we commit sins. And I hope the preacher talks about sin today. I, I don't think you got up thinking that today, but most of us kind of like Achan. We try to bury our sin. Pretend it don't happen. Sweep it under the rug and hope someday that that sin will go away. There's an old saying in the scriptures. In fact, it's scripture says, be sure your sins will find you out. Sooner or later, they will pop up like a rattlesnake and bite us in the face. But it's always there. Sin, a constant reminder of brokenness. And Paul told the church at Rome, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. And you know what? We as a church would be better off as we come to the service to worship God, to come in as a fellowship of sinners saved by grace instead of saints of God who have no sin. Because every day of our life, we either commit a sin or we omit to do something that God tells us to do and we're just as guilty. And therefore, unless we get it under the blood of Jesus, it's on us. And it continues to fester like a sore. So this morning, I want to talk about three mistaken ideas that a lot of people have about sin. One, a lot of people say, well, you know, one little sin won't hurt anything. One little sin. Well, that's what Achan thought. He thought by me taking this little bit of stuff from Jericho wouldn't hurt anything. But you see, God had forbidden nothing to be taken. It's like in the Garden of Eden. God told Adam, you can have the fruit of every tree except for that one tree. And the day you partake of it, thou should surely die. And you know, in the liberal mind, they would think, what kind of God is he to give such a command and then to bring such judgment on Adam and the earth and Eve as well for, for breaking maybe one little law. But see, one little law in God's sight is a major law in our sight, and we should remember that. Now, one little sin won't hurt anything. That's the prevailing wisdom of the world, not the church necessarily. It's just a little white lie. Have you ever heard that? Well, I want to tell you, a white lie is just as bad as a black lie. It don't matter how big or how small it is. It's a lie. It's a lie. Just a few vulgar words every now and then, or just a little alcohol, or just a little pornography, it won't hurt anything. And I might as well just dive into this thing on pornography. You would be surprised at the number of preachers that stand in the pulpits today that are obsessed with pornography. They spend most of their time in front of the computer watching pornography instead of studying God's Word. And you might think I'm a little raw there. They're not going to admit it. But it's detrimental. Now isn't that Adam and Eve that it's just a, one little piece of fruit that got them kicked out of the garden? Moses said this, God, I just got a little mad and struck the rock when you told me to speak to it. And it kept him from entering the promised land. Over in the New Testament, there was a couple named Ananias and Sapphire. They lied to the Holy Spirit. They said, Let's just keep a few dollars from ourselves and it got them struck down at the apostles' feet in the church. 
Now, if that were to happen today, it'd scare all of us to death, wouldn't it? Aren't you glad that we live under the grace of God and not under the law of God? Even though the law is important, we need to keep the laws of God. Friends, it's a serious thing. In verse 19, Joshua said to Achan, Son, tell me what you did. And Achan bowed his head because he was caught. He said, When I saw among the spoils the beautiful mantle and some silver and gold, I coveted them and took them and hid them in my tent. You see, Achan probably thought to himself, It's not much. I only took a little bit, but it isn't the size of the sin that makes it so serious. You know what it is? It's the sin itself. Small, medium, supersized, it doesn't matter. It's the sin itself that makes it serious. One little sin breaks the heart of God. Have you ever thought about that? From our point of view, it may seem small, but from God's point of view, a view of disobedience is disobedience. One little sin is a very serious thing in the sight of God. Why? Because He's a holy God, a righteous God. And He wants His people to be holy. He wants His people to be righteous. And I want to tell you there's no excuse in the world, in the books, that every child of God lays his head down on the pillow at night, cannot confess whatever wrong he's done that day, and sleep in peace. Why? Because Jesus gave us that promise. If we'll confess our sin, he's just and faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. Isn't that a great promise? And then another thought that a lot of people say, said, you know, my sin is my business. Nobody else. Nobody else's business. That's the prevailing wisdom of the world. My sin, my addiction, my domestic abuse, my lifestyle is my business. It might be wrong, but I'm not hurting anybody but me. I wonder if that's what Aiken thought. Well, it might be wrong, but it's my business. But Achan's sin affected not just himself and his family, but it affected the entire nation of Israel. Israel went into battle with sin in the camp and they were stopped dead in the tracks. You know, Paul's favorite analogy for the church was the body of Christ. Now listen, when he wrote to the church at Corinth, he had to address a serious situation. Now listen to what was going on. There was a man in the church who was living with his father's wife. There were people in the church who were doing, being selfish and arrogant and rude. And Paul writes and basically says, your sin is tearing the church apart. Your sin is affecting the whole church. That's why John Wesley gathered those early Methodists in classes and bands to watch over one another in love and help one another work out their salvation with fear and trembling. Aren't you glad for people like John Wesley? They held one another accountable. They loved one another enough to look each other in the eyes and say, how is it with your soul? I never will forget in all of my ministerial meetings that I had when Hugh Davis was district superintendent. Every meeting we had, He would go around the room and ask us personally, how is it with your soul? So that question is before us this morning. How is it with our soul? And if someone refused to acknowledge their sin and repent back then, they loved one another to, enough to confront them. You see, my sin is bigger than me. If I commit a sin, guess what? It just doesn't affect me. It affects the entire church. And that's how it is with anybody else in the church. If you commit a sin, it just doesn't affect you. It affects the entire body of Christ that you're a part of. And a lot of people can't see that. Well, it's my sin, my business. Nobody has to know about it. And then... Another misconception is you can keep your sin secret. 
Back in the day, back many years ago, there was a man named Lynn House. He played football for the Washington Redskins. And uh, he made a statement one time about breaking curfew. He said he and his roommate would take blankets and pillows and put them under the covers so that when the coaches did the room check, it would look like they were already asleep. Well, one night his roommate was getting ready to get out to go out and he couldn't find any extra pillows. So he took a lamp from the nightstand, put it under the covers, and it looked like it looked fine, but when the coach came in and turned on the lights, the whole bed lit up. Numbers 32, 23, as I said a while ago, be sure your sins will find you out. You might think your sin is hidden, but somebody, listen to this, somebody somewhere knows. Your spouse knows. Your friend might know. Your pastor might not know. Your neighbors might know. Moses thought he had gotten away with murder, but somebody saw him kill that Egyptian David thought he had gotten away with adultery and murder, but Nathan pointed the bony little fingers in the king's face and said, you're the man. I want to tell you, <clears throat> politics is nasty today. Y'all agree with that? If you plan on running for office anytime soon in the local office or state office, you better get your act together. You better not have any skeletons in your closet because guess what somebody somewhere is going to dig them up now i wouldn't run for dog catcher in the city because i have too many skeletons in my closet and somebody somewhere knows where they are luke 12 2 3 says nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered and nothing secret that will not be known therefore whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you have whispered behind closed doors will be proclaimed from the housetops. I want to tell you, isn't that, that scripture says you cannot keep your sin a secret. So what is the answer? What, what are we supposed to do about the sin that is so permeates our lives and our churches and our world? Very quickly, I'm going to share three short things. First, remember God's word. Before the Israelites marched around the city of Jericho, God said, don't touch any of the thing in the city, destroy everything. But Achan forgot God's word. And that's the problem today. We look at God's word and we just, you know, we pass it over like a dish rag. Dish rag. Oh, it's just something to lay on the mouthpiece, lay on the coffee table, or lay, lay by our bed sand. But we hardly ever open it to read. Study to show thyself approved a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And I want to tell you, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And many times all we have to do is just read God's word and it tells us. It's like a photo, it's like a camera. It takes a picture of our life. Don't touch anything. But in order to remember God's word, we need to hear God's word. We need to read it. We need to proclaim in worship. We need to read and study and meditate on God's word every day. Remember God's word. And second, we need to repent of our sins. Boy, we don't hear much about repentance today, do we? Now, we don't hear much about it, but sometimes I wonder if we really believe that we are so good we don't need to confess our sins and repent anymore. That's the problem. We hear too many feel-good messages about ourselves and say, boy, I feel pretty good. Preacher didn't preach against sin today, on sin. I feel pretty good. I walk out with my head hanging high and that sin's still under there. Preacher didn't touch on it. I want to tell you, if every preacher throughout America I'm talking about every preacher, not just one, would stand in the pulpit one Sunday and preach against sin. We might see a difference in some of our churches. But we don't hear much of that. Because, you see, the natural man wants to hear something good. He doesn't want to hear that he's got sin in his life. He doesn't want to hear that sin separates him and God. He doesn't want to hear that. He would rather say, hey, you're loved. 
You're beautiful. You're wonderful. Go out in life and just rejoice. There's nothing wrong with you because God made you. And you're precious in His sight. Well, we are. But I want to tell you, sin separates us from that loving God. And third, and lastly, we need to renew our commitment. It's not bad to fall down. Everybody's fallen sometime or another to fall short of God's glory. Everybody does it. We're all broken. We all sin and fall short of God's glory. The bad thing is that when we continue to wallow around in the pig pen instead of getting up and getting on with our commandment, uh, commitments to God, we have a problem. I want to tell you this. You lay down in a slop pen with the pigs and you'll come up smelling like pigs. Emmett Smith is all-time leading rusher in the NFL history. I read a story about him. In 15 seasons, he carried the ball, ran for 4,409 times, 18,300 55 yards, that's an average of 4.2 yards every time he touched the ball. Now listen to this. You know what that tells me? Emmett Smith got knocked down 4,409 times every 4.2 yards. Emmett Smith got knocked down, but he kept getting up, dusting himself off, running back to the hollow to do it all again. No, it's not a bad thing to fall down every once in a while, but you've got to keep getting up, dusting yourself off with the precious blood of Jesus, and getting back in the game. In Revelation 2, Jesus told the church at Ephesus, remember, repent, and continue to do all the things you did at first. Renew the commitment. After Achan and his family and all their possessions were destroyed. God said to Joshua, take all your men against the city of Ahi now. And don't be worried. I have handed you the city and you'll destroy it within minutes. And he did. Why? Because sin was no longer in the camp. I don't know about you. I come to you with a broken heart. But I want to live as much as I can, a victorious Christian life the rest of my life. I want to do everything that I can for the glory of God. And whatever time I have left, I don't want anything that I do or anything that I don't do interfere with God's purposes and God's plan for my life. And certainly, I don't want my life to be a stumbling block to any of you to where you can't carry out your plan for God. So I've got to deal with sin in my life. And yes, as a pastor, we've got to deal with sin in our churches. And so I wonder, are you victorious? Are you living a constant life of defeat and discouragement? Things can change today, right now, right here, this very moment. God can do a deeper work of love in your heart and grace within us and myself and among us this morning. So the question as we come to a close, will you let him do it? In Christ's name. This is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Please stand together. Thank you for joining us for this message from Reverend Wayne McDonald. We would like to take this time to invite you to learn more about our churches by visiting us at calvarycharge.com or by following us on Facebook at Calvary Bethel Centennial. Remember that we are alive together in worship. As Ephesians 2, 4 through 5 says, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Thank you.